Hello, I'm Paul Zimmy Finn, and this is the Generation Report. In an address before a joint session of Congress during an especially tense time in American history, an American president said the following, quote, Let it be clear that I am asking the Congress and the country to accept the firm commitment to a course of action. Now this is a choice which this country must make. We should decide today and this year, unquote. On the matter being discussed, America did decide that day and that year. For then, as stated in the fourth turning, America was, quote, functional and future-oriented, the national sum greater than its parts, unquote. The date was May 25th, 1961, that president was John F. Kennedy, and that commitment was sending Americans to the moon and back before 1970. America, functional and future-oriented. Almost sounds like a dream, doesn't it? Two weeks ago, the launch of NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley aboard the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket opened a new era in American manned spaceflight. Speaking for myself, I watched the launch and some early coverage of the mission, only to go right back to checking updates on everything else that was taking place. I imagine many of you who are listening did the same. The reason is straightforward. However much interest and excitement a spaceflight or the announcement of a forthcoming spaceflight might generate, no amount can distract us for long when our country feels dysfunctional, bitterly divided, or both. At the outset of President Kennedy's term, the country was felt to be neither. Today, as the Crew Dragon capsule circles the Earth docked with the International Space Station, the country could hardly feel more of both. Numerous times over the past six decades, American spaceflight has proven to be a venture which must be seen as serving a crucial purpose, and one that fits not only the era, but the moment in time. To reach its potential for generating attention, popular enthusiasm, and an association with the perceived best interests of the country. Some examples of how the social moods of history have touched American spaceflight, as well as what the cycle of history suggests should be our approach to spaceflight in the years ahead, will be discussed next. It has already been established that the American high after World War II was a time when, to again quote Strauss and Howe, America saw itself riding a quote-unquote carousel of progress from which, quote, the future had specificity and certainty, unquote. Still, the broader context of the era in which President Kennedy gave America the mission of reaching for the moon merits a deeper examination. The space age began with the launch of Sputnik 1 by the Soviet Union on October 4, 1957, and for the next six years, the Cold War was at a fever pitch. Barely 100 miles from American shores, a communist dictator came into power. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev framed his nation's support for quote-unquote wars of national liberation against ostensibly sinister American motives. As Kennedy and then-Vice President Richard Nixon sought to be elected president in the fall of 1960, Khrushchev was actively scheming to reconfigure the United Nations to swing the body towards Soviet global interests. And as events after the spring of 1961 would bear out, Soviet scheming was far from finished. Between 1958 and 1963, every advantage either side in the Cold War demonstrated, in persuasive rhetoric, in diplomacy, in intelligence, in military might, and in science and technological capacity, was seen as of paramount importance to serving its own ideals, its own economic strength, and its own security in a nuclear age. To be second in any of these areas was seen as a threat to the nation's survival. And on the new frontier of space after Sputnik, America was conspicuously behind. This was the context in which American manned spaceflight began, as well as in which ambitions for the expansion of spaceflight began in earnest. Admittedly, it is not a public opinion poll, but I believe the importance the American public conferred upon spaceflight during this era is well reflected by this anecdote. According to The Atlantic, between 1959 and 1963, stories about NASA astronauts ran in 28 separate issues of Life magazine. As a means of comparison, when was the last time you came across a story about an astronaut in any major publication prior to three weeks ago? As for a testimonial to the research and development devoted for manned spaceflight during the high, one need look no further than the March 1964 issue of National Geographic magazine. In a feature article written by Deputy NASA Administrator Hugh Dryden, most every general hardware design for the Apollo program was already conceived. In many cases, the hardware was already being constructed on a factory floor, all less than three years after the late president's speech.
Many revisionists in recent years have belittled the Apollo program as a gratuitously exorbitant adventure whose achievements amounted to little more than a quote-unquote status symbol. These voices ignore that when Apollo was conceived, the national mood was quite different than it would be in the late 1960s and early 70s. Rather than being focused on Vietnam, Americans and their leaders were focused on the Soviet Union and on how, as a nation, we would counter an adversary who wanted to, in Khrushchev's words, bury us. The all-time apogee of American spaceflight was reached on the evening of July 20th, 1969, when Apollo 11 astronaut Neil Armstrong spoke the first words and took the first human steps on the moon. 650 million people from around the world watched on television. After Armstrong and his crew returned home, they received a ticker tape parade down New York's Fifth Avenue, then embarked on a 29-city, 24-country global goodwill tour. What is not remembered as well today is what took place surrounding the mission just prior to its leaving for the moon. On July 15th, the day before the crew launched from Cape Canaveral, an assembly of 500 led by Reverend Ralph Abernathy came to Florida for a protest. Abernathy himself addressed a rally at the Cape, saying, quote, We may go on from this day to Mars and to Jupiter and even to the heavens beyond, but as long as racism, poverty, and hunger and war prevail on the earth, we as a civilized nation have failed. Unquote. How did two events so seemingly contrary to one another happen almost simultaneously? That's easy. By the summer of 1969, America had long since passed into the awakening Strauss and Howe confer with the name the Consciousness Revolution. In these eras, to quote the fourth turning, people seek, quote-unquote, soul over science and, quote, exalt rights over duties, self over society, ideals over institutions, unquote. Reverend Abernathy's words reflected this emergent mindset of spaceflight as incommensurate with a worthy or worthwhile cause for the time, and variations of this belief were by then commonplace. According to Chief NASA historian Roger Launius, Americans throughout this period, quote, consistently did not believe Apollo was worth the cost, unquote. The cost factor is often cited as why Apollo would come to an end ahead of its planned schedule in 1972, and with reason. What is not recognized enough is that a sea change in the perception of the value of spaceflight had stimulated concerns with its cost in the first place. During the Consciousness Revolution, as America was ascending to its highest height of space achievement, the nation's sentiments toward the venture were already in dissent. At the heart of that decline was an enormous high-to-awakening value shift that associated spaceflight with an institutional order much of America no longer trusted. Like all seasons of history, awakenings eventually pass, and by the 1980s, the social milieu which had ensnared Apollo in the values clash between America's institutions and its social consciousness had come and gone. In its place came the unraveling, bringing, in the words of the fourth turning, the end of the, quote, old group-defined values, unquote, and the confirmation of a new culture of, quote-unquote, self-discovered meanings. In a carryover from the awakening years, the American sense of meaning for spaceflight was at a low ebb. With no clarifying public purpose brought by the new space shuttle flights and mired in a void of charisma, enthusiasm, and relatability, spaceflight had become unsettlingly banal. Meanwhile, the state of American education was a hot topic. In 1983, the U.S. National Commission on Excellence in Education released A Nation at Risk, a scathing report which assessed America's schools as, quote, a rising tide of mediocrity, unquote. The report continued, quote, our society and its educational institutions seem to have lost sight of the basic purposes of schooling. Education should be at the top of the nation's agenda, unquote. Recognizing these breaches, President Ronald Reagan announced on August 27, 1984, that NASA would send the first private citizen, a teacher, into space on a forthcoming space shuttle mission. Said Reagan, quote, I can't think of a better lesson for our children and our country, unquote. From a field of more than 11,000 applicants, a winner emerged in the summer of 1985, a high school social studies teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, Krista McAuliffe. The terrible tragedy that would ultimately take the lives of McAuliffe and the rest of the Challenger crew on January 28, 1986 is one of the signature where were you when moments in recent American history. Yet even amid the sense of lasting loss the tragedy invokes, it is important to remember the purpose of McAuliffe's selection as well as recognize the shot in the arm she personally gave the space program and the lasting impact she left on education given the context of the era.
In a time when values and horizons for individual possibility were emphasized over the duty to serve civic objectives, no one was a more engaging spokesperson for expressing the purposes of spaceflight and teaching than Krista McAuliffe. Upon her selection as the teacher in space, the national press seized on McAuliffe's likability with a round of space as human interest coverage not seen in many years. Far from merely being a good PR advocate for a public agency, McAuliffe was seen as the person who was ushering in the age of space for ordinary people. And in the months after the tragedy, numerous foundations, hundreds of thousands in private contributions, and a congressional fellowship program to support teachers were all established or donated in her honor. The memorializing of the entire Challenger crew continues today in innumerable contexts, but one name among the seven heroes stands out. For in a time when both spaceflight and education needed to be reinstilled with principle by people willing to serve on their behalf, Krista McAuliffe served both. To briefly recap, since its inception, spaceflight in America has often been shaped by the social priorities of the season of history we have been living through. During the American high, spaceflight was an avenue through which the nation sought to demonstrate decisiveness, competency, and supremacy in the face of Cold War tensions. During the Consciousness Revolution, the nation completed the mission it had set out to achieve during the high, but pulled back from that mission once a new social consciousness made it clear that its costs were no longer seen as justified. During the early phase of the unraveling known as the Culture Wars, spaceflight assumed the mantle of a stage upon which a charismatic, purposeful individual could represent the nation's dedication to values. Which leaves one turning left, this crisis. Quote, out of the debris of the unraveling, a new civic ethos arises. Collective action is now seen as vital to solving the society's most fundamental problems. With the civic ethos now capable of producing civic deeds, a new resolve about urgent public goals crowds out qualms about questionable public means. Unquote. This, of course, is an excerpt from The Fourth Turning, describing the morphology of what generally happens to societies during crisis eras. That historical context is the one into which America has recently returned to the endeavor of manned spaceflight. Today's transfer of spaceflight design and ownership to the commercial space sector is noteworthy, yet spaceflight is still seen as a venture that serves national and transcendent more than private interests. There is a critical stumbling block in the way, however. America has not achieved a civic regeneracy yet. For those who may not be familiar with what a regeneracy is, I devoted an episode to that subject earlier in this series. Here is why this is crucial. Unless and until America enters a regeneracy phase during this crisis, pursuits not seen as paramount to the public interest, as critical to tackling America's most fundamental needs, those areas will have an exceedingly difficult time keeping public support. At this recording, suffice to say, spaceflight is nowhere near the forefront of the American public's focus and concern. In his statement at the Kennedy Space Center following the SpaceX launch, Vice President Mike Pence invoked the Apollo launches of the 1960s as a parallel to what is taking place today, both for the space program and for the country. The problem is, what the Vice President called that era's, quote, tumult and clamor, unquote, was, as we have seen, chipping away at the national sense of purpose for spaceflight, even as we were ascending to our highest achievements. In my view, today's rejuvenation of the spaceflight program does not make it immune from the forces Apollo faced in the 1960s, nor that spaceflight has continually faced since its inception. Going forward, American spaceflight will see plenty of ebbs and flows in the level of public support and enthusiasm it generates but to sustain support and enthusiasm over the long haul and achieve all of its possibilities in the years ahead, it must continually be calibrated to a purpose the American public sees as being of surpassing importance. And that purpose will continually change, because the national mood changes with the seasons of history. To our political leaders, NASA, and our mavens of commercial space, Balance the desire for America to be first with the understanding that keeping America first will require that you work with the national mood, not in spite of it. In closing, I want to first express a godspeed to Colonel Benkin and Colonel Hurley as they continue their stay aboard the International Space Station through the summer. Second, I want to briefly revisit the story of a person I mentioned earlier, because I believe it serves as a powerful demonstration of both what spaceflight is all about and why history is so important. 
In her application to be the teacher in space, Krista McAuliffe spoke of not only the passions the early achievements in space had stirred in her, but of the approach to history she relayed to her students and how she saw spaceflight as a platform to spread her perspective throughout education. Quote, Social history of the common people, joined with our military, political, and economic history, gives my students an awareness of what the whole society was doing at a particular time in history. They get the complete story. Suggestions for class projects include collecting oral histories of different generations in order to compare perspectives about the progress of the space age, and debating the merits and uses of space technology in terms of politics, science, defense, art, and as an aid to humanity. Unquote. And finally, here is an audio excerpt from one of McAuliffe's interviews with NASA prior to her selection, answering a question about her philosophy of living. The philosophy of living, I suppose, is to enjoy life and to certainly involve other people in that enjoyment, but also, um, because of the country that we live in, to be a participant and to enjoy all of the things that we have in this country. This is the part where I normally relay what my next episode will be about. Right now, given everything that's going on, I have no idea what that will be. What I can say is I will do my best to keep it to the standard that you have heard so far. Thank you for listening. Stay safe. And may God bless America.